Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is the District 3 community meeting, and we're discussing neighborhood issues tonight. I want to welcome all of you. Um, it's been a tough year, and it's been, for some, extremely difficult having lost loved ones due to COVID-19 and its progeny. But tonight, we just want to come together as a neighborhood, as a district, and talk about some of the important issues uh, for tonight. It is my hope that you will be sending Susanna Porras, the district liaison for District 3, questions during um, the evening. I hope that I've brought together a group of exciting uh, professionals who can share life from their perspective. And I also want to give a special shout out to Women's History Month. And I think in some measure, that is why uh, I've asked one of the most prominent uh, city employees uh, to join us tonight in Michelle Bonaris, our city attorney, city prosecutor. So first on the agenda, is our Pledge of Allegiance. And I would like to welcome Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Johanna Tolosa. Join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Blair High School in the house. Thank you very much. It is my custom as always at our community meetings to welcome the Blair High School Junior ROTC uh, to open our meetings. And I'm happy that uh, Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Johanna Tolosa is with us tonight. Thank you very much again. Thank you for having me. The next item on the agenda, before, before we get to the next item on the agenda, I'd like to just say a brief word about our Asian American Pacific Islander brothers and sisters. Um, a lot of hate a lot of violence has been directed to the members of our community who happen to be Asian or um, Pacific Islander. We as a community need to have a strong message to rid our community of such hate, such violence. And I hope that all of you have had an opportunity to read the statement that I sent to you and to the press related to um, that violence and how we need to arrest, eliminate that kind of violence anywhere in the world, but particularly in California and the rest of this country. Without further ado, I'd like to take this opportunity to share some of the highlights of what's happening in District 3. I hope that we have a map that shows some of the uh, developments, some of the happenings in our district. So the first thing I'd like to recognize for my brief uh, opening remarks, again, is that we're celebrating Women's History Month and there are extraordinary women all around us, starting with our moms, and spouses, um, the ladies who are at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Caltech, the city of Pasadena, Pasadena City College, Huntington Memorial Hospital, and many other institutions in our community. I wanna draw your attention to the North Lake uh, Traffic and Pedestrian Safety Enhancement Plan. The city of Pasadena is conducting a safety enhancement corridor study for North Lake Avenue from Mountain to Maple Street. Uh, if you have 
additional questions or questions about that, you can text them to Susanna or you can email to them to Susanna or certainly we will be available uh, by email or phone at a later date. Thirdly, I'd like to recognize that um, we are working diligently uh, related to vaccines by appointment for eligible persons. You will be required to present proof of eligibility for 65 and over proof of age and proof of city of Pasadena residency or employment in Pasadena is required for those, for those with severe medical health conditions as defined by the California Department of Public Health, you must sign an attestation of eligibility and proof of city of Pasadena residency or employment. Um, if you have any questions about the registration process or need additional assistance, please reach out to the Citizen Service Center at 626-744-7311. Or by email at C as in Charlie, S as in Sam, at cityofpasadena.net. The Citizen Service Center is open Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Then I'd like to just recognize something extremely important housing in the city of Pasadena. Habitat for Humanity Home Ownership application period now opens from April 1st to April 30th. A quick overview. Pre-applications will only be accepted online from April 1 to April 30. Additional information can be found by going on our website or their website at B as in boy, I as in igloo, T as in Tom, dot, L as in Larry, Y as in yellow, forward slash, S as in Sam, G as in go, V as in Victor, H as in Hector, O as in Oscar, and S as in Sam. Or you may email homeownership at S as in Sam, G as in Go, V as in Victor, H as in Hector, A as in Adam, B as in Boy, I as in Igloo, T as in Tom, A as in Adam, T as in Tom, dot org. That's home ownership at sgvhabitat.org. Or you can call. I'll give you a moment to get your pen out. 626-937-2010. Now, also, I would like to bring your attention to the California COVID-19 re relief program. This is for folks who are rent is past due uh, specifically. Landlords who have income eligible renters experiencing a financial hardship due to COVID-19 with past due rent. Renters who have experienced a financial hardship due to COVID-19 have past due rents or utilities and have a household income that is not more than 80% of the area median income are eligible. I'd like to give you the number for our local partner on this particular program that will assist you in applying for rent relief. You can visit housing is key. That's again, housing is key.com or call 833 430 2122. And that call, of course, is toll free. On the screen right now are some of the hot spots in District 3. And I'd like to just go through them quickly. And we're more than happy to email or text this particular map to you if you would just simply call our office at 626-744-4738 or leave it here in your chat 
and we'll pick it up there and send you this particular slide. So first, I'd like to draw your attention to 631 Cyprus, where there's a demonstration urban farming, raising produce, and teaching visitors about food security. Then I'd like to talk, uh, draw your attention to 63 East Colorado Boulevard. I know it's difficult for you to actually make out the locations. So I'm giving them to you and we're going to send them this map to you so you recognize them a lot better. So 673 East Colorado, they're converting an existing cinema into multi-tenant commercial building at 655 North Oak Fair Oaks. Of course, we have Vallarta Supermarket that is second to none in the city of Pasadena, if not the county of Los Angeles in terms of fresh produce, high quality food products, uh, et cetera. So please continue to visit Vallarta Markets. Also at 1771710 North Fair Oaks Avenue, the new mixed use development with 70 affordable senior housing units is still on track please contact our housing office if you have an interest or know of someone who has an interest, they can certainly contact the District 3 office. At 452 North Los Robles, there's going to be a 227 residential unit uh, development. Uh, that is going through the community uh, listening process currently. At 30 West Mountain, there's gonna be a new medical office building. The reason why that is so important is because the heritage housing partners, both North and South will have, are, have seniors or will have seniors and they will have access to quality medical care in walking distance to those developments. At 274 North Oakland, there's a new six story, highly affordable, 181 unit SRO, single room occupancy project. At 94 and 96 Villa, there's a proposed relocation of existing house and new 7,000 square foot building. At 745 and 765 North Orange Grove Boulevard, there's a mixed use development that's at the north east corner of Orange Grove and Lincoln. And that is a 10,000 square feet of commercial space and 46 residential units with subterranean parking. Those are just some of the brief, or those are just brief overviews of some of the special things that are happening in District 3 that I wanted to draw your attention to was not extent was not meant to be exhaustive, but I wanted to give you an overview, a flavor of the exciting things that are happening in District 3. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Michelle Bonaris, the city attorney, city prosecutor, who will take us through hopefully a couple slides about where we are related to community oversight of the Pasadena Police Department. Please welcome Michelle Bonaris, our city attorney, city prosecutor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Kennedy. It's, it's a pleasure to speak to all of you, our uh, constituents and residents of District 3 in the city. And there is a PowerPoint presentation that is going to be uh, presented. And we can start with the next slide as I go briefly, very briefly over the background regarding the Community Police Oversight Commission, which was recently created by the city council for the city of Pasadena. And that was on October 5th of 2020, the council approved that ordinance, creating the commission and also the position of independent police auditor. That's not a city employee position that is uh, an entity or a person that will be selected 
to serve as an independent police auditor, which I will discuss briefly in, in a few moments. And then between October and November, the city council had a few meetings where uh, they considered various approaches for how to appoint commissioners to this newly created body. And then in January of 2021, just a couple of months ago, the city council approved the policy of appointment and uh, referred the establishment of rules and regulations to the public safety committee for consideration and recommendation to the city council. Next slide, please. Those rules and regulations will, uh, will return to the city council uh, later. So briefly, uh, some of the uh, functions and the purpose of this commission are, stat, are set forth in our municipal code at Title II, Chapter 60. And uh, it provides that uh, the purpose is to essentially enhance, develop, and strengthen community police relations and review and make recommendations regarding ongoing operations of the police department to the city police, uh, city's chief of police, city manager, and or the city council. So those are all of the entities that this uh, body would refer matters to. And some of their functions include those listed here, uh, getting community feedback, monitoring and receiving reports regarding police department hiring, not uh, involvement in individual hiring decisions, but the overall concept of hiring uh, processes, et cetera including some aspects of personnel investigations, there are limits with respect to that. Also uh, providing input in advance on uh, po police department policy recommendations and issuing subpoenas for records, but there are limitations with respect to that. So it would not include personnel records and it would not include subpoenas for testimony of city employees. Another area that would be covered is monitoring and publishing statistics on police use of forces by our police department and complaints um, and outcomes within the department. Next slide, please. The commission will have uh, 11 members that will be appointed by the city council and they will have uh, three year terms and the initial body will have staggered terms. There will be eight members that will be nominated by the mayor and city council members, one each. And there will be three members nominated representing community-based organizations. And that would be based on... The city attorney is back with us. Okay, the challenges with technology. My apologies, I had... Um, I had a signal saying I had a weak internet connection. I know the wind, the wind has um, affected my access today, so my apologies. Um, but we will go ahead and move on to slide four. Thank you so much. The three members nominated re representing community-based organizations would be those who are referred by community-based organizations that have involvement in the city of Pasadena. On the commission, all members must be Pasadena residents. However, the resident uh, that is appointed or nominated by a particular council member does not have to reside in that council member's district, but they do have to reside in the city. The city council will make the appointments which will be based on nominations from council members and then the public safety committee will refer applicants for consideration for the community-based organization seats. Next slide, please. And by the way, we have received uh, more than 100 applications. The deadline passed March 15th, and it is anticipated that the city council will consider this uh, in April, and the Public Safety Committee will um, consider the community-based organizations, representatives, and appointees early in April. The, the independent police auditor uh, will be approved by the City Council and gone through a process of review 
uh, by the city attorney's office. We have received approximately nine proposals for consideration. And at that same meeting in probably mid-April, uh, we will have that matter considered by the city council and possibly selected at that time. The independent police auditor has a, a variety of duties, uh, which include being an advisor to the commission, uh, the IPA, which is what this person, this entity would be referred to as, will have some experience in working with police departments and working with jurisdictions. Um, and so they would be in a position to give advice to the commission. They would have access to um, police department personnel complaints and investigations and review various investigations of bias based policing and recommend policy changes um, to the commission, which would then go to the full city council. Next slide, please. There are some limitations on the extent to which the commission can be involved, uh, primarily based on state law and then the city's charter, which provides for some of the limitations. And uh, that's involving confidentiality with respect to police officers and their personnel records and files. Uh, there's something called pitches motions, which would be the way that someone could get access to personnel records. And there are only certain circumstances that that could apply and that would be for the court process. And uh, with respect to certain critical incidents, uh, individuals may be able to get access to some ask, some files in personnel records, not all, uh, through a Public Records Act request. With respect to the Peace Officers Bill of Rights, which is a state law, there are also limitations uh, with respect to an officer who's being investigated and the extent to which their information, their personnel records, et cetera, could be made available. In terms of uh, the city's charter, which uh, is involves the people voted um, to have a city manager form of government, where uh, the city manager is the uh, responsible executive for personnel decisions that are involved in the police department. As a result, the IPA and the commission um, can't directly or indirectly take an active participation in personnel matters. They can't take personnel actions. They can't use records that have been developed uh, to take personnel actions. And they can't direct that action be taken on particular police department employees. They are more a policy group with respect to that and can look at particular incidents though, um, but their involvement with personnel is limited based on state and our local charter provisions. Next slide, please. So finally, some of the next steps that will be taken, as I mentioned in April, this matter will go to the city council. And at that point, it's expected that the council will appoint the commissioners and will authorize a contract with the independent police auditor. And then from there, the city council will uh, review commission rules and regulations once that IPA is selected. And we will also have to address budget and staffing at items to be sure to uh, be able to fully implement the commission and uh, the IPA position. So that concludes my report. And again, my apologies for the technical glitch, um, but we, we learn to adjust and adapt. Uh, thank you very much, uh, City Attorney Michelle Bonaris. We appreciate the update related to the uh, commission and uh, we are grateful for your guidance through this process and we'll get the full commission underway very soon. Again, thank you for being here uh, this evening. And I might add that if the constituents are taking a look at our newsletter that just came out, I believe yesterday. There's a familiar face in that newsletter related to Women's History Month. And I think that face may be yours, but
But in order to verify that, I would ask all of my constituents to take a look at the newsletter. So again, thank you, Michelle. Thank you. At this point, I'd like to welcome the head of city government, uh, Steve Mermel, who is the city manager, and he is going to share some of the budget updates. Now, the reason I made that invitation is because it's your money and you need to know where it's, how and where it's being spent. So without further ado, please welcome the city manager of the city of Pasadena, Steve Mermel. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. If I could get the uh, PowerPoint put up, I have a short three slide presentation. <clears throat> so as council member Kennedy indicates, the, the budget's a big deal because it's your money at work. And uh, every single year, the city council appropriates money for the operating budget and the capital budget. And we're entering our budget season now. So we have really two different types of budgets. We have the capital improvement program budget, and this funds major investments in city infrastructure, repairs to sidewalks, streets, uh, community centers, pools, parks, all of those projects are contained in the capital improvement budget. And every year, the city council sets aside about $90 million in recent years to pay for those types of projects. So this is a long-term investment strategy in the city's infrastructure. Many of these projects take a number of years in the planning stage, then they move to the design stage, hopefully they get funded and we move forward. So that's long-term, that's like taking care of your, your own home. What people think about more commonly with the budget is the operating budget. And this is what pays for all the different city departments operations. The city has uh, multiple departments. We're a full service city, one of only three cities with its own health department. We have our own water and electric utility. Uh, we provide an awful lot of services. Within that, Within all the departments, we have over 130 different funds. That's how we organize the money uh, that is spent by the various departments. But in general, we focus mostly on the general fund because that is one of the city's largest funds and it pays for most city services that we think of. It pays for police, fire, parks and recreation. It pays for about 80% of the library operations. So that's the one that gets most of the focus. And in our, our current year, the operating budget for all the city departments is almost $880 million. And the general fund portion is just about $270 million. Next slide, please. So when we talk about the budget, and I'm the one responsible for submitting the budget to the city council, what drives my preparation of the budget is really the little chart you see in front of you. This is our general fund five-year forecast. We put into this our revenues and our expenses for past years, for the current year, and for a few years going forward. And then we take a look and we, say, we see, well, is the trend positive financially? or is it negative? When I became city manager five years ago, our future trends were negative, a lot of red ink. Council member Kennedy would get on me. He would tell me no red ink, Steve. So the city council made a series of reductions. They cut over $6 million over a few year period. And then ultimately we went to the voters and asked all of you to help support critical city services by implementing a sales tax measure, measure I. And you supported that and we thank you for it. And that helped the city get back into balance and created some extra money for us to spend on our capital projects. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic and related recession has blown away 
the surpluses that we were going to have and put us back where we were several years ago, where things are tight again. We've lost over $30 million in revenue. We spent over $20 million responding to the pandemic. We're hopeful about the $52 million that's earmarked for Pasadena in Washington's relief program. We don't yet know all the details. It's not built into our coming year budget because we need to wait to see what is the money specifically for, and we'll address that as it comes in. My hope is that it gets us back to where we were. But as we put together next year's operating budget, if I let this forecast guide me, and this tells me we don't have a lot of room to maneuver. So I've directed all the departments to submit essentially a status quo budget. Not many new initiatives, uh, not many new staff positions, just essentially status quo, which is what, how we handled the current year budget when we adopted that a year ago. Next slide, please. So this is the schedule for the city council to review the budget. <clears throat> and once we have it ready, we're compiling it now, we will put out an announcement that it's available for people to look at on the internet. Typically, we keep a copy in the clerk's office and all the libraries. We're hoping to open three of our libraries in the middle of April. So until you can go look at it physically, we'll put it online when it's ready and you can see it. <clears throat> but here's our calendar. On May 3rd, we'll have a public hearing on the Capital Improvement Program budget. And we're hoping to adopt it that same evening. On May 17th, I will make a presentation to the city council, big picture, 40,000 foot, sort of where are we financially, what's driving the budget. On May 24th, June 7th, June 14th, and June 21st, we will have discussions on the recommended operating budget. We suspect maybe two, two and a half hours a night for the council to review the major activities of our various departments. Typically, most time is spent on big departments like the police department, the fire department, uh, parks and recreation. Not a lot of time on the small departments like Michelle and mine, because we have relatively small budgets. But I would invite all of you uh, to review the recommended budget, to tune in for the discussions on the budget, to submit public comment, we're going to start taking live public comment soon, so you'll be able to speak in your own voice if you wish. But if you send in a comment, I assure you those get read as well. And you can always send me comments or questions about the budget. I like to share information with the budget uh, on the budget with citizens. In the past, we've done public presentations. And frankly, not a lot of people come because uh, the budget's a big thing. And maybe it's just not that glamorous, not as glamorous as a District 3 community meeting, that's for sure. <clears throat> but it's important, it's important for you to understand where the money goes, because that's, uh, that's what sets the priorities for the city. So I welcome your input. I'll make another plug. On April 1st, I'll be doing a little presentation with our local NAACP chapter on the budget as well. So if people wanna learn a little bit more, I'll be talking about that then, so look for an announcement. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. I'd like to thank our city manager, Steve Mermel, for that brief uh, budget in brief, if you will, of where we are as a city, the process that we undertake each year and developing our budget. I think it's critically important that residents of the city of Pasadena have a good understanding of what is the process and how do we develop an outcome to keep our city in the black, to keep our city in the black, not the red, in the black. And since uh, Steve Mermel has been the city manager of the city of Pasadena, it has been challenging and it is even more challenging today to keep us in the black. And I have every expectation that the city manager will figure out how to keep us in the black. Thank you. With that, 
I've asked the city manager to make some very important introductions of key staff. And so please do so at this time, Mr. Mimel. Thank you, council member. It gives me a lot of pleasure to introduce to you all our new fire chief, Chad Augustine. Chief Augustine comes to us from the Sacramento Fire Department, which is a big city. He spent more than 10 years there. And he had a broad range of responsibility, including operations, administration, human resources, professional standards, training, and emergency medical services. Did you know 80% of our calls to the Pasadena Fire Department are emergency medical calls? So it's very important. He was responsible uh, for supervising 650 sworn and civilian, uh, 70 civilian employees. Uh, so he comes from a big city. He knows big city issues. Pasadena has big city issues. The chief earned a, a bachelor's degree from Waldorf University. He has a master in legal studies, watch it, Michelle, uh, from the University of Arizona, and he graduated uh, magnum cum laude. Uh, he also holds a chief officer certification from the California State Board of Fire Services. He's a certified paramedic, and he's worked as a flight paramedic for numerous years. In his free time, he enjoys CrossFit. He doesn't just enjoy it, he's won many awards for it. Uh, he enjoys aviation as a fixed wing pilot, and he likes to work with youth in the community, help them achieve their goals. He's been married to his wife, Sandra, for 24 years. They plan to reside in the city of Pasadena. We'll give him a pass right now. He's in a, a rental unit in Glendale, but he and his wife are gonna find a nice place in town. And uh, I'm really happy to have him on board. I think this is his fifth week on the job. And with that, I'd like to just turn it over to the, to the chief so he could uh, say a few words to us all. Chief? Steve, thank you very much for the introduction. Council Member Kennedy, thank you very much to you and your entire team for allowing me the privilege to be here tonight. Um, I really feel just honored to be here and so thrilled to be working in Pasadena. I told my wife last weekend that I already feel uh, like Pasadena is home. And I had went to visit her in Sacramento and I felt like I was just visiting and, and came back to Pasadena feeling again, like, like it was home. So it's so excited to be here. Um, I'm a seasoned veteran with one month and one day on the job yesterday uh, was my one month anniversary and, and just having a lot of fun and, and uh, uh, working with so many great people. Uh, I'll just outline three of my top priorities, if that's okay. The very first one was uh, addressing our vacancies. Um, Pasadena Fire has uh, 190 budgeted positions and just over 160 of those are um, on the suppression side. And we had close to 30 vacancies. And with the numerous, uh, just as being a full service uh, city, as well as services at the Rose Bowl and wildfires up and down the state, um, it's a challenge for us to um, maintain that level of service without adequate number of personnel. So that's been um, our number one uh, priority. And we're pleased to announce that we have an academy that starts at the end of next month. Um, we're also working hard to expand on our, um, our port team, which is our Pasadena outreach uh, response team, which we partner with um, a public health nurse as well as a social worker. And really what it allows us to do is instead of being a one size fits all um, where somebody calls 911, we're really able to connect them to the, the right services that that individual needs. And give them the full wraparound services, whether it's it's social, emotional, mental health, housing. Um, so we're really proud um, to be able to have that level of service. And then my third priority is community partnerships, um, specifically for disaster preparation. And, and we know that it's not if, but when that disaster is coming. And whether it's a fire, flood, earthquake, a pandemic, um, we can't do that. We can't handle every emergency by ourselves, but I'm confident with 140,000 plus strong Pasadena residents um, all partnering together that uh, we can make this the safest city possible. So those are my top three priorities. 
again, I'm honored to be here and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to just uh, do a, a little introduction this evening. Uh, Chief Augustine, I wanna say welcome to the city of Pasadena. I hope that you have an extraordinary tenure as our new fire chief. I think you have uh, probably one of the uh, sharpest, well-qualified, experienced uh, fire departments of its size in the state of California. So you come to an organization that uh, is extremely well equipped. However, there are some challenges and not at this meeting, I'd like you to share uh, your plans for diversity, the plans of possibly running or the possibility of running your own academy, meaning the city of Pasadena and uh, how we are going to recruit more women on the department. And the reason I'm giving you a pass and not asking you to answer today because we haven't had an opportunity to really meet. And I think um, you're going to have ample opportunity to speak to the community, speak to businesses, owners of businesses rather, uh, organizations, uh, representatives, uh, et cetera, to really understand the fabric of Pasadena. And hopefully we're weaving uh, a new fabric that is more diverse, more responsive, uh, and extremely qualified. So again, I want to thank you for uh, joining us at the District 3 community meeting, and I hope you have an extraordinarily positive tenure as our new police, as our new fire chief. Thank you. Council Member Kennedy, thank you very much, and I'll, I'll look forward to th that conversation. Thank you. Uh, City Manager Steve Mermel, you have another extraordinary introduction, I'm told. I, I do. Um, someone with just a little more tenure than Chad. Uh, you know, it's been it's been a real pleasure for me to to be able to select really qualified people to serve on the city's executive uh, leadership team. Chad being our latest one. Uh, but somewhere in the other nine, uh, I was fortunate enough to appoint John Perez as first acting chief of police, and then following a nationwide search where he came out clearly on top to appoint him as, as our police chief. And I've lost track of time, whether it's two years or three years. I'm sure for the chief, it feels like it's seven or eight years. Uh, Pasadena runs at a quick pace. And I'm often in calls with the chief and chiefs from neighboring cities and their city managers. And the truth of the matter is they can't hold a candle to the department that Chief John Perez has shaped and continues to shape. Uh, Pasadena is a very busy place. Uh, when it's not COVID, we have lots of, lots of activities, lots of special events at the Rose Bowl and elsewhere. Sadly, we have a lot of police calls for service as well, and the chief will talk about some of those. I talk to the chief almost every single day uh, because of events that go on in our community. And he's gonna tell you a little bit more about it, but, but right now it, it's, it's a tense time in our community. There has been a lot of community violence. Uh, I lose count by now, it's, it's March 24th, I think we've taken over 85 guns off the street this calendar year alone. So the chief has his team out there working. They're working hard to make sure that our community is safe. Uh, but any one of these incidences can, can turn and be tragic. Uh, we want everyone to be safe. Pasadena is a safe community, but we're having uh, some flare ups as it relates to gang related violence. And the chief's gonna talk about that. But, but let me just say, all of us should feel extremely confident in the leadership of John Perez. He has a vision for his department, which is progressive, but is also mindful of the need to protect our community members. He's got the right 
balance. He's got the right stuff. I'm proud to say not only is he my chief, he's my friend, and his birthday is this Friday. I left you a gift on your desk, sir. So here's the chief. Thank you, sir. We were friends up until that point, sir. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, I, I'm fortunate uh, to serve here. I think our community is going to enjoy our, our fire chief uh, so much. I've talked to him on occasion already. We've spent lots of time together and his ideas for fire mitigation and some of the things we could do as we go forward with the uh, concerns for wild uh, fires happening uh, every year. We're going to be pretty impressed with what he offers us. So uh, to the city manager's point, thank you, sir. Uh, it's always difficult as a chief to give these presentations, especially after the type of year that we've had. We are looking at the largest increase in violent crime in our country's history at 35% from one year to another. And you see Commander Art Shute that'll help me out in this presentation uh, to fill any gaps that I have. Um, and so the highest level we've ever seen before was 12 and a half percent in this country. To look at a 35% increase from one year to another is dynamic. Why that's important is our historical numbers, much like Pasadena for this country are still very, very, very low. That's a good thing, but we cannot take two or three more years of 35% increases in violent crime or return to where the state we were in in the 1980s and the early 90s, if you recall, what Pasadena and other cities were like back then. As it comes to Pasadena's crime, uh, overall, our reorg last year came in. Uh, we changed some of our models. We created new models. Um, everything has a shelf life. And so we adjusted our, uh, our own approaches by eliminating the gang model we had for 35 years and creating something new. That I believe it's starting to take place and we're seeing it. Overall this year, we have a 10% drop in crime throughout the city. We are seizing a high number of firearms uh, at a faster rate than we did last year at 85%. You know, our hearts and our prayers are for everybody that's lost life in Atlanta and also in Boulder with gun violence, but what doesn't go too far by us that our hearts and our prayers and our support also go out to everybody in Pasadena who's lost family members uh, to this gun violence that we've suffered through and people being shot. So when it comes to what we're doing, we are using our prevention intervention and enforcement model. Prevention is about being visible. It's about cutting uh, down the potential for crime just by being at the right places. And part of our new model is looking at the data, looking to where we need to go, and using Commander Archute and Commander Jason Clausen's approach, making sure we're in those right places. And it's starting to make a difference. When it comes to the, the number of shootings, the two homicides this year, the number of shootings where people lost life last year around Villa Park, we are making progress in those investigations. We need some more time. Um, and so we keep pushing forward on those efforts. When it comes to intervention, we have to be out there. We have to be out of the cars. We have to walk the parks and we have to be in some places. To give you an example of the good work being done under the models is at La Panarasco Park, uh, we've had uh, this year uh, 104 proactive engagements. That means the officers were not in enforcement mode, but out there visibly, doing preventative work, talking with people, talking with staff, 104 times, and yet we've only had five calls for service. That's, a, that's positive for us. Same with Jackie Robinson Park, 196 positive engagements in the park, and we've only had nine calls for service. Brenner Park, 14 proactive engagements and only four calls for service. So the model's working. It takes time for us to get where we need to get to. One of the important parts, much like the fire chief spoke of, is filling the vacancies. And we are filling the vacancies as quick as we can. For us, if we opened up positions today, we wouldn't see those in the street for two years based on the hiring structure and the carefulness we go through to hire somebody. And so we opened it today. Again, it would take two years to see them uh, in a police uniform out in the street. But we are making advancements. There are some concerns in the district a uh, council member that we are challenged with. One is the high number of guns still being pulled throughout the city with 85 this year, um, and a high number of ghost guns, which basically means that they are untrackable guns in our community. People are purchasing and putting the kits together. Uh, we, we are dealing with some issues around Brooks Avenue with large, uh, loud music uh, from vehicles and uh, other type of problems on that street. 
Uh, we've been working, our watch commander, Marsha Tagliaretti, has done a wonderful job of working with community residents and trying to find some resolution. Again, these take a little bit of time as we work with code enforcement, we work with our chief prosecutor, we work with other people's, not just the police department, but we try to extend that energy out to make sure it's a holistic and collective effort with our community in doing these, these type of projects. Uh, what I'll end with until I get some questions a little bit later, council member, is our homeless issue. Um, the homeless issue two years ago, the police department under the direction of uh, Steve Mermel, we were able to create uh, a new vision and begin to change the model of how we approach homeless uh, issues. The large majority of homeless people are not criminals. A large portion of our homeless are addicted to some type of drugs and they do need help. So we created a new unit in the, in the police department called the Neighborhood Services Section that includes our bicycle officers, our HOPE team, our park safety specialists, and they work together to try to work on these issues. And we're about to roll out in the next couple of months a new project that over the last two years, we began to uh, you know, transfer some of our calls to nonprofits. And it's taken us up to you know, sometimes hours to try to find a nonprofit to help us out with these calls. But we're, we, we predict we could do about 8,000 calls per year to redirect them to nonprofits. So it's gonna take a little bit more time. Uh, we're fortunate for the fire department, the support team, the health department with their clinicians, the LA County social workers are doing all that work, but more to come on that. And I'll save the rest of the time council members for any questions that might come up on crime. Uh, Chief, there are a couple questions that are quick questions. Uh, it's not always about enforcement and engaging black and brown young people. Uh, and I wanna understand your philosophy uh, about the police department engaging young men and women who happen to be minority uh, in a non-enforcement posture. Can you share any of your philosophy or views on such? Absolutely, what it, it requires is for officers to recognize an opportunity to engage. And that's one of the reasons we eliminated the old style of gang uh, enforcement that we saw for 35 years. Uh, we incarcerated a high number of people. We stopped a lot of the crime doing that, uh, but it also did its damage. I grew up in a community like that where we dealt with uh, the local sheriff's department and being stopped on a regular basis. Uh, it, it, it does cause trauma over the decades. It does uh, break the trust between police departments and the community because there's always gonna be critical incidents such as an officer involved shooting that separates the community uh, from the police department. So we have to try to understand those dynamics. So our officers have received training and all the new officers receive it. And we just created a course for our supervisors that went through it. And it is a way for them to understand how to um, really design their own style of communication in police uniform. So people are more relaxed with that approach. So we've trained the majority of the police department, introduced them to new communication models. We've done role playing, different type of scenarios, and it occurs for all our new employees. This is only about uh, maybe a year and a half, close to two years old. So it takes more time for these type of initiatives to pick up. The Zoom has been great for us, council member. We are doing uh, a number of weekly Zooms with young people and tutoring them for school. It's a fantastic way for us to maintain those relationships. I know there's a lot of concerns about keeping the police out of the school. Uh, and so away from that, we haven't lost our focus to try to create the relationships. Many are trying to block any type of relationship. So somehow as a community, we have to create the unity and separate the division somewhere down the road here. So that the prevention and the intervention parts are important council member. If we're not dealing with a crime, we have the, the opportunity to get to know our young people, not just by Zoom, but through our PAL program, the Explorers, our community services section, which has been redesigned. We now call it community relations section. It's doing a great job. Soon we're gonna roll out uh, the uh, community knocks where we introduce ourselves uh, to people at their homes by knocking on doors and asking what's going on in communities. You'll see that rolling out. So nothing is more important than our youth. I conduct a couple of Zoom um, um, conferences every, every month with uh, a couple of the schools and some youth groups. And it is probably the best source of interaction I get 
to really learn from the young people what we need to be doing different. And some of the reorganization we have done has come from their ideas and uh, their thoughts on this. Um, how many types of positions do you have in the police department that are temporary and compensated and would be available for a young person uh, under the age of 20, uh, not necessarily on a track, but possibly on a track to become a police officer. Thank you. And, and those opportunities are for police cadet, um, also for um, our youth advisors. And between them, we have over 20 positions available that we open up for our community. And many of those don't enter into policing. They go off to become lawyers and they enter the military and they go into the private sector or in the public sector in different areas. So we have many of the young people that come into us uh, and then they leave us into other professions. And recently, um, it was probably a couple of years ago for Glenn Thompson's retirement, they brought in uh, some of the former explorers, youth advisors and cadets. And there must've been 80 people in the room in various industries and professions. Um, it reminded me how important this program is and where our young people go when they leave us if they don't become passing police employees. And you mentioned the number is 20. Do you have the capacity and the resources to double it or would you consider that? Yes, in fact, uh, we have the capacity to increase that and we're looking at that now. Uh, these are part-time employees. Uh, so we try to use some of our, um, our budgeting processes to increase that. And uh, we've been having that discussion over the last few months, trying to double the amount of police cadets that we have. Um, all these positions require college and it doesn't increase the city budget at all. I wouldn't do that to the city manager who, who would know when I did, uh, but uh, we are very careful about how we bring in new people and we're getting closer to be able to expand that to, uh, to more people. And where it's gonna help us, uh, Mr. Kennedy, is gonna be uh, the ability to open up the police department later in the evening and, and really having the police department services uh, there for the people who need it. And it really teaches our young people how to engage uh, the public. I was a police cadet at 18 years old with the police department, and it helped me a lot learning about administrative processes, how to communicate with people, and basically how businesses run, whether it be private or government. So it is a great opportunity that uh, I am a product of that, of that system. Thank you very much, Chief. Um... I believe every council member, in, including the mayor, has a place for you to address uh, the community. The role that you play in this community is critical and sometimes misunderstood. And the more you are out and about, and I know you already are, talking to families, individuals all across the community, not just in Northwest Pasadena or in districts one, um, five and three, but the whole community, they need to hear you and you've made yourself available. And I'd encourage you to d even do more. Uh, that's why it's difficult being a cop. We always want more of you. So thank you very much for your presentation. Chief Perez and I look forward to doing everything I can to help you succeed. And I hope that uh, the policing models that you use are inclusive of uh, the honest feedback, feed forward that you receive from organizations in Pasadena, including Black Lives Matter uh, and some of the other organizations. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that very much. And we do communicate with all our organizations, whether it be a protest or a demonstration, we do work with them, as you know, over the past year uh, during these difficult times. So, and I appreciate Commander Archute, who's on the line, who has helped with many of those processes and the planning for those efforts. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to share a photograph of Art Shoot as Santa Claus, but I can't bring it up at the moment. But I'll just say about Commander Shute that uh, he grew up in our department. He's from Temple City and he's committed to Pasadena. 
and he wants to see this city and our residents uh, excel. That means the young people, that means getting young people away from gangs, uh, gainfully employed, and we appreciate that. And that is our ongoing expectations for your commander, Chief Perez. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I have a question for our city manager, and that question comes to us from That question comes to us from Marjorie Lindbeck. And the question is whether there is a process to audit each department to see whether it requires the same amount of funding each year rather than just continue with the status quo. Uh, Steve Mermel. Sure. Well, essentially the annual budget process does that. The city council reviews the level of financial resources it's providing to each department. And if the city council wants to reallocate those resources, it can do so through that process and any time during the year. But the reality is all the services that the city provides are are clearly on display. You can learn a lot about the services we provide by looking at our website. We always try to be efficient in our operations and to reduce the costs of what we're doing. Generally, for everything we do, there's some constituency that is asked for the service. And then of course, for all the services we provide, you need to have support for that. You need to have a finance department, a human resources department, we have to have our attorneys because it's a litigious society out there and they need to protect the public purse and protect the city from liability claims. So we also have an internal auditor that is in my office. It's a group of two and they uh, look at the city's operations. Essentially, it's that classic. They're out there seeking out waste, fraud and abuse. We have a fraud hotline that people can call to report if they think there is waste, fraud, and abuse. And we look into these things to make sure that the money uh, of the taxpayers is being spent efficiently and appropriately. Uh, for those of you who've been around a long time, you know that many years ago, a decade or, or more ago, we were the victims of a horrible embezzlement by a city employee. And we put a lot of safeguards in place following that to prevent that sort of thing. And our internal audit group was a result of that. So they're often going around the city to make sure that we spend our money efficiently and we're spending it on the programs that our constituents want as determined by the city council and direct public comment. Fantastic, thank you very much, Mr. Mermel. I have a number of questions and I'll go in this order. I'll ask the question to a city attorney, city Council prosecutor. member. I I would just point out, I think we also have Mitch Dion from the Water Division to do a short presentation this evening. Okay, then let's let's do that. If everyone can stay with us, uh, Michelle Bunneries, Chief Perez, uh, Fire Chief. Um, we'll go to Mitch Dion. I think if you would, City Manager, I would ask that you uh, tee up or welcome Mitch I think I've had a portion of his presentation, uh, but I'm very much interested in what he's going to be sharing with us tonight. Uh, if you would, uh, city manager, I'd appreciate if you'd welcome him. Sure, briefly, uh, Mitch Dion has been with us for a few years now. He's a, a great find for us, very, very well versed, long history in the water industry. He's really brought a fresh perspective to our water utility. We have a, a very good water and electric utility and it's, it's good that our community owns its own water and electric utility. Uh, we have challenges with uh, supply, uh, with contamination in water, uh, with the cost of water. And, and Mitch has brought very creative thinking to our water division. This is uh, obviously a critical issue. There's no life without water. 
Uh, and so it is often something we don't think about. We turn the tap and out comes the water, but a whole lot goes into that. And so Mitch is the guy to make sure that when you turn to the tap, the water comes out and it's safe for you to drink and it, it gets from point A to point B. So let me turn it over to Mitch Dion, who's the Assistant General Manager for the Water Division. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Kennedy. And, and thanks to, to the public that's here tonight. I'm, I'm just always enthused to be able to get to talk about these exciting programs that Pasadena has actually enabled me to do. So with that, if we bring up a slide presentation, uh, I can talk a little bit about something that's very exciting uh, and it's right here in Division Three. So if we move to the next slide, please. Many people don't realize that here in uh, Pasadena, right off the corner of Mountain Avenue and Sunset, we have a couple reservoirs. Those are those facilities in the center of the picture here. The one is a, an egg shape and the other is uh, elongated. Those are two separate reservoirs. Uh, we call the Sunset Reservoirs one and two. Um, not much creativity there. Uh, the, the significant thing about Sunset Reservoir One, it was actually placed into service in the 1880s. Uh, and the Sunset Two was placed into service around 1900. So these are very old facilities. Uh, certainly we got our money's worth, but they're worn out. If we move to the next slide, um, the, the com combined the reservoirs hold about 15 and a half million gallons. And the reservoirs have had significant structural issues, including leakage, only when they got water in them though. Um, and they've compromised the water quality. So ultimately the State Water Resource Control Board mandated that we remove these from service in June of 2020, which we did. But the water supplied from the sun Sunset Complex, I just changed terms when I started talking about the complex resource, reservoirs, it serves about 25% of the water demands. Next slide, please. So there's some other facilities going on here. We've got the Bangham Well on the very north end. We have the Sunset Well. We've got the Chlorida Pump Station. We have a disinfection facility, and we've got an awful lot of employee parking that also occurs at that site. Next slide, please. So what we're doing is we're actually replacing the storage. That's the primary component that's going with the, the concept. We'll have three large concrete tanks or two large ones, one small one. We're gonna have a renovation of the Bangham Well. We're gonna introduce treatment facilities. We have upgrades to the Glorietta pumping station, replacement of some lines in Sunset. We have to still restore the same number of parking spots and we've got to reestablish access for large trucks to come in and services. So there's a lot going on on this site. It's a really exciting project for me to tell you about what's coming up next. Slide, please. We're changing the approach of water. Um, and ultimately it's significant, I think, as we deal with our groundwater. And I know with Council Member Kennedy, it's near and dear that I provide the best water possible, not just meeting the minimum standards required. And so we're gonna remove the contaminants from the water at this site. And the contaminants are some legacy perchlorate from the JPL site where they were doing rocket testing in the, in the, in the Second World War. We've got one, two, three TCP and some other contaminants. And we have some nitrates there. And by removing them, we can ensure that the water is going to always be safe and a high quality water um, by using proven technologies of the, the activated carbon and ion exchange. Um, and ultimately we're making provisions to treat for nitrate in the future because we know that's coming our way. And so we, we're going to be prepared. Next slide, please. So how, how does this affect the neighborhood? Well, certainly we're gonna see some new fencing, the landscaping surrounding the site, the perimeter. We're gonna improve the facade of the Glorietta pump station. Uh, and we're gonna expand a historic uh, monument at the front to give a, a tribute to the neighborhood and the history of the reservoirs as it served the economic growth and development and the transitions of those neighborhoods uh, so long ago. In addition, it's going to improve the water quality for everyone in the city. It's going to help us produce groundwater without blending with imported water. So that improves our, our local reliability and continues to give us great tasting water. 
So with that, I got a schedule on the next slide. It's a big project. It takes a couple of years. Um, the city manager only lets me accumulate nickels slowly, but we put these into the capital fund. Now we have enough money to go do this program. We're actually in the design. Uh, we're gonna initiate our, our CEQA process, which is the California Environmental Quality Act to ensure that we've mitigated all the appropriate things that need to be addressed. So those additional considerations are gonna be things like, when are we gonna work? Well, we're gonna work during normal working hours, but it's gonna be noisy. How do, we control, how do we control the noise from the neighborhood impacts? There's likelihood of dust and traffic, and we're gonna to have to deal with alternative parking. These are some of the things that we'll be dealing with as we develop this project and are able to talk to the neighborhoods more closely as we get the project scheduled. So with that, uh, I got the next slide that shows uh, a couple issues. Um, you can see um, the cracks on the one, and you can just see that just simply these reservoirs are pretty well worn out. Um, if there's additional uh, information needed, on the next slide, I've got some contact information. Uh, and again, I would encourage everyone to go to our website because that's the first place to start with all of our key project updates. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, sir, uh, Mr. Dion. Um, this is a very interesting. Water always uh, is important to me in discussing uh, where we are as a city. The, the question always is, is our water safe? The water that is provided to all the residents of the city of Pasadena. And the, the answer unequivocally is our water is safe. Okay. And we certainly meet all the state and federal standards. And our goal is to be better than safe and ensure that our water tastes great and doesn't necessarily leave all the little white deposits around the, the rim that we always get. So we're trying to improve our water quality even beyond what the standards are. Uh, thank you, Mitch. If you could stick, stick around for a little while, there may be one or two other questions. Uh, the first question that we have is for city attorney, city prosecutor, Michelle Bonarese. It is, will the commissioners and the independent police auditor be able to see the past records of applicants to the Pasadena Police Department in order to prevent the department from hiring officers who have been fired elsewhere for misconduct and especially racist incidents and complaints in past departments? The personnel process would not provide for their review of those documents on an individual basis in terms of reviewing particular candidates' backgrounds. Thank you. The next question Council, is- Council member, Council member, really quick, I should probably add something to that is that we are so careful in our backgrounds and who we're hiring, uh, being terminated from other police departments, have any type of blemishes or marks, is gonna exclude them from being hired, not just as new police officers, but as laterals. We turn down so many that try to come here for different reasons. We are extraordinarily uh, careful about that. I know that doesn't make the entire community feel better just by me saying it, uh, but we are really careful about that. But that's all I add to it. Thank you. Thank you. The next question for the city attorney, city prosecutor. How can we make sure that the IPA is actually independent from the Pasadena Police Officers Union? The uh, union would have no involvement in the selection or oversight of that uh, position of that entity. It would be through either our office, which the city attorney's office, which has no role or um, with the unions and uh, through the city council. So they would not have a role in terms of overseeing or selecting or, or um, that type of involvement with the IPA. Okay. Uh, now we're going to move to police chief John Perez. Thank you, 
uh, Michelle Bunneries. What is the new gang policy and what proof do you have that it will work? Thank you. Um, well, it's not really a policy. It is the old model of policing that went out the window. The old model of throwing a net into a community and pulling it back and uh, seeing how many blacks and Latinos we've stopped and asking them what gangs we're from no longer has a place in our community. The years of doing that um, didn't work when I was a kid and you know it's just time for it to change. So what we are doing, we know 100% of our gang activity is focused on African-American and Latinos. So that is where our effort is at. That's why stop data is so complicated to look at because if you're looking at black and Latino gangs and trying to stop that activity, your numbers are likely to be higher in those areas. And if we try to balance those numbers out, it's not gonna stop some of the violence caused by gang members. But we're using science as the answer to that. We're using data, we're doing constant assessments of our deployments, looking how we're conducting these efforts, and we're combining it with our community um, engagement and our visibility, as well as the internal training that we're doing on cognitive and immersive type of training to for officers to understand uh, implicit bias and some of the other issues that causes dynamics. So that combined with the, with the other training we're doing uh, for our officers on communication with the young people is working. We could see it by the number of complaints dropping, the use of force dropping in other areas. So at this point, I don't know if it's gonna work. I could be wrong, but with a 10% drop in crime already this year and seizing these weapons off the street, I wanna say by mid year, I'll be able to really have an understanding of how this is working. It's a constant weekly assessment. Uh, thank you, Chief. The next question. I would like to hear whether one of the new initiatives is about de-escalating violence and using non-lethal methods whenever possible. Yes, in fact, last July we created a, we designed a program to start tracking our de-escalation and to date, we have probably between six and 700 incidents of de-escalation in which officers were confronted with a very dangerous or stressful situation and used some type of communication to gain cooperation. Uh, this morning, I heard one uh, with an officer at a scene where the, uh, the person began charging the officers and threatening to kill him. And so as I heard on the radio and more officers responded, several officers arrived on scene, I thought for sure we'd have some type of use of force incident. Instead, we had uh, no use of force and the person taken into custody uh, with minor injuries and being taken down to the ground. So it, that's an example of where we're going. And this was a very, very new officer. So I know the training is working because that young officer who's been off training for just a few months knew what to do in handling the situation. Thank you, Chief. I'd like to move directly to the fire chief. Is there a specific neighborhood disaster organizing program that the fire chief will implement in the city, such as LA County's five-step neighborhood action plan? Fire chief. I want to give a shout out to uh, Chief Perez his team on their air ops gave me a, a, an aerial view of the city and some of our big threats this last week. And, and um, some areas that I have concern on um, is our wildland urban interface and specifically our access and egress. Um, and my, my top priority there is to make sure that we partner not just with um, the police department, but also with code enforcement so that um, we identify good emergency access and egress routes prior to that disaster happening. Um, some of those roads are very narrow um, as we go up in um, up into the canyon. And if we don't have coordinated efforts for evacuation, we won't be able to get resources in there in a timely manner. Um, and any delay that we have can cause uh, widespread damage and loss of life. Uh, Chief Augustine, are you familiar with LA County's five-step neighborhood action plan? No, sir, I'm not. Okay, so that's a question that we'll have to get back to this particular resident. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, Council Member Kennedy, I, I would point out that, and the Chief obviously is getting up to speed with all of our programs. We have our PERT, the Pasadena Emergency Response Team, which uh, I would assume is similar. I haven't looked at the LA program, but I assume is similar. It provides training to, pa to Pasadena residents what to do in the wake of an emergency. We also have our CERT teams. And Lisa Dadarian, who's our public information officer, has been leading the charge on those training activities, which sadly have been curtailed uh, because of COVID. But as we're coming out of COVID and now with the new chief on board, I expect that soon we'll be able to ramp up our community training. Again, it's just a matter of time before there's a big earthquake. Uh, we fear uh, wind storms. We're concerned about fires. There's plenty to be worried about. So there's plenty to train people uh, to be prepared for. So you've actually answered the second question, which was related to, will the new chief restart the CERT program in Pasadena? You just said that the CERT program still exists. And she's gonna reevaluate all of our programs and he's gonna uh, make an assessment and he's going to strengthen them and he's going to enhance them. Thank you. So that'll be on his evaluation for us. Thank you. Next question is, Uh, this is for our deputy, I mean, our assistant uh, general manager of water and power. And the question is, <laughs> please ask the guy about what is being done to mitigate the contaminants to the residents when the area is demolished and they're specifically referencing the Sunset uh, Reservoir. Absolutely. Um, those are the exact types of things we'll be addressing with our mitigation measures that we'll come up with as a result of the, the support process. But dust control is certainly going to be a very important one. The kinds of contamination that we'd be dealing with are really going to be the remnants of, of a reservoir and the construction materials were there. The metal roof, the, the beautiful clear redwood that are part of the rafters and, and the, the roof suspension, and then the concrete uh, and removing that out. Uh, we're not dealing with uh, the kind of contaminants that, uh, that create um, a, a extremely hazardous situation, but we're gonna be monitoring the air quality to ensure that any dust or any particle, particulate matter that might be there is contained on site. We'll certainly use a lot of uh, standard dust control mechanisms like watering the site, uh, having a, uh, a dust barrier off the, the one side and that kind of approach to dealing with it. But certainly it's a real concern and something we're addressing. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, next question for you. Mr. Dion, has there been an environmental impact report on what will happen during the demolition? That's exactly what we're working on with the CEQA process will be those types of environmental impacts as a result of the demolition. Where will the employees park? There are not enough parking spaces on sunset can they park at the Rose Bowl and take the shuttle? So we're exploring parking alternatives. Um, we've reached out to neighborhood churches and other people that have parking lots in the area uh, with the potential of making rental arrangements with those. And our fallback position is to use the Rose Bowl and provide an additional shuttle for employees. And the last question for you, Mr. Dion, Will our water on sunset be shut off with old plumbing? The pressure moves rust. So the areas on sunset should not be impacted. And I say should because ultimately until you start a project like this, um, but the portion of the system we're working on is really over on the distribution side of the, the supply side, not out in the distribution system. So ultimately um, we don't 
anticipate having residential customers turned off during any portion of this construction. And Mitch, I thought I heard you mention that we haven't been serving customers from those reservoirs since I think you said June of 2020? Correct, those, those two reservoirs have been offline um, set for almost a year at this point. Right, so none of that means none of our customers in the area are actually getting their water from that reservoir. So when we shut it off and, and we'll be able to continue to provide service to them and there won't be any sort of interruption in flow. I understand the concern about old pipes. We've had some claims that we've paid uh, because uh, water pressure has changed and it's caused some damage to people's uh, plumbing. Okay, well, uh, Susanna, are there any additional questions before we move to wrap up this evening's District 3 community meeting? Uh, everything I had, I emailed directly to you. Thank you very much. You're welcome, my pleasure. Um, let me say that we want to thank all of our participants and guests and residents uh, tonight, I think we had a good meeting. Uh, it is not as well attended as uh, meetings that we've had in person that sometimes reach as many, three, as many as 300 folks, but the right people were on the line tonight. They asked very good questions. And for those questions that were not answered, it is my expectation that staff will communicate through this office and by other means to answer those questions. So we wanna again, thank Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Joanna Tolosa, the Blair High School JROTC want to thank City Attorney, City Prosecutor, Michelle Bonarice. We want to thank Steve Mermel, the City Manager, our new Fire Chief, Augustine, the perennial employee, 30 plus years, uh, relatively new as our Police Chief, I think the last three years, John Perez and his command staff. Now, having said something earlier about command staff, the police chief brought it up. So the police chief has to deal with it. I would ask that staff, whoever's assisting us from IT, bring up a little photograph of Commander Art Shute. This is Commander Art Shute, one of the top executives in the police department at a District 3 community meeting. And the young resident seems to be comforted and Art Shute seems to be having a Santa Claus time. Uh, so we wanna thank Art for being the type of uh, leader in our police department that he can come over and help a district three meeting, holiday meeting. So I guess, John, you made a good selection. Thank you for bringing up th that photograph IT. Then I want to thank uh, the assistant general manager of our water and par power department, Mitch Dion. He has an awesome responsibility and I'm going to hold him accountable for safe, clean, and affordable drinking water and the removal of the contaminants at certain wells that were caused by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory dumping perchlorates and other contaminants into um, the earth. And it trickled down from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The Environmental Protection Agency is engaged as well as the city of Pasadena and other jurisdictions in making sure that there's appropriate cleanup. I'd like to bring to the attention of those who are still on the line that uh, District 3 office 
invites residents of the city of Pasadena to request up to 10 individual face masks per household. Requests can be made online starting Monday, which was last Monday, March 22. The facial masks are limited to city of Pasadena residents only. Supplies are limited, maximum of two packs again, which equals 10 masks per household. Masks will be mailed while supplies last. And I have a quick disclaimer that our city attorney requires me to read. And the disclaimer is, please understand that our face masks are not a replacement of medical grade personal protective personal protective equipment. And in circumstances where medical grade personal protective equipment is recommended, you should consult a healthcare professional. The decision to use this face mask is solely your own. Again, the decision to use this face mask is solely your own and no warranties are made regarding protections provided to you by this face mask. So again, wanna make sure District 3 residents, but anyone in the city of Pasadena would like us to mail you up to 10 uh, facial masks in a household, we are happy to do so. Uh, let me see. Uh, Susanna, you may want to come on in a moment, but at the moment, I would simply thank all of the residents of District 3 and those who logged on for this District 3 community meeting discussing neighborhood issues. It's difficult in the pandemic, obviously, but I would be remiss if I didn't give it a hell of a good try to bring as many residents together to receive critical updates of what's going on in District 3. That's my job. That's a part of my execution of my fiduciary duty, not only to voters, but to all residents in District 3. Susanna, if there's anything that we've missed, do not hesitate now to speak. There will be a recording of this video available and we will blast it out at a future date. And also please remind everyone that uh, we are available via email or phone and we will be putting up that slide shortly. So if you would wait just a moment, we'll put up a slide with our contact information. Again, I'd like to thank all the residents and those who participated in making presentations tonight. I think it was very helpful and we're looking forward to planning a deeper dive at our future uh, District 3 community meeting. So if someone would put up that uh, informational side in terms of how to contact District 3, there it is. Again, thank you, gracias. And let's leave that up for a couple minutes, and then we'll log off. Thank you again, everyone. Have a peaceful night and uh, hope you have a pleasant dreams tonight. Thank you very much. Good night.